Last weekend's loss to the Manly Sea Eagles was a costly one, as it signalled the possible end to the Newcastle Knights' chances of taking part in the big end of season fixtures. However, coach Alan McMahon and the officials of the Red and Blues believe it is possible to make the five, but the hurdle seems insurmountable as they meet the Panthers on Sunday. Penrith are coming off a surprise loss to Parramatta last week, and they have lost form second rower Mark Geyer for the battle with the Knights. The home ground advantage, which the Knights have used to the fullest this season, will once again come into play as both teams strive to improve their respective positions on the ladder of the Winfield Cup. A team that hasn't got too many worries about its position on the table are the Newcastle Falcons. Languishing at the bottom of the National Basketball League, the Falcons meet Westside Melbourne Saints tomorrow night at Broadmeadow. Westside aren't much better off and are only two places in front of the Falcons. These teams have engaged in some monumental tussles over the years and tomorrow night's match should be just as exciting as the games before. The Keyboard Festival will be a combination of lectures, public performances as well as three musical competitions. It will incorporate five keyboard instruments, the piano, the organ, the harpsichord, clavichord and forte piano, making it the largest such festival in Australia. Performers have been attracted from interstate. A major component will be the John Sinclair Scholarship, where 20 Hunter students will buy for $12,000. The winner, after approval from the Conservatorium, could study at any overseas musical institution. I think it's a very important festival for Newcastle and the Hunter Valley because it's the first time anything like this has been done. I think it has a bright future. The Keyboard Festival will begin August 14. Willie Lafitte, NBN News. It's the last round of the competition proper and western suburbs appear to have the minor premiership wrapped up. Lakes and North Nelson Bay will battle to see who will end up in fourth and fifth spots respectively and Wests, Maitland and South are assured of the double chance during the finals. It's also the final series of matches in the Newcastle Rugby Union and it's a battle for the minor premiership between Merriweather, Carlton and University. Also up for grabs is the last position in the final four. Maitland are on 17 points with Mayfield East and Hamilton on 16. All three have relatively tough matches this weekend. Two rounds of Newcastle men's hockey will be played over the weekend as we draw towards finals time. The Tigers' North match has been deferred, while on Sunday, South and West should provide the fireworks. Well, what a day to spend on a floating palace. 34 such wonder craft made the arduous journey from Boken Bay to the Royal Motor Yacht Club of Toronto today to take part in the 15th annual visit between the two clubs. Commodore of the RMYC of Toronto, Bernard Summers, took the salute from the parading motor cruisers and yachts along with rear Commodore Alf Doyle. Tomorrow all boats along with invitees from the RMYC will compete for the Coal Trophy and then attend the annual dinner tomorrow night. And if the weather holds, I could think of worse ways to spend a lazy weekend. The RSPCA first received calls about this small herd of cattle on a property at Wakefield several weeks ago. When those were followed up by more from concerned passers-by, local inspector John Carter decided it was time to act. He arrived to find the cattle just as the callers had described them, grossly underweight in a paddock bear of any fodder. That was when Mr Carter decided it was time the owner answered a few questions. Yes, good morning sir, oh. how are you? Mr that? Carter from the RSPCA, do you happen to run those cattle across the road there? Yeah. They're yours, are they? Yeah, mine and the sons. Well, you better come across with me and have a look at them. There's one or two not in the best. We've had several reports no, on them. No, we're feeding them. Feed them? We're feeding them. Yeah, you may be feeding them, but apparently there were one or two there with calves and not getting enough, that's the problem. Yeah. And uh, these people had a report on them as well. Oh, they come out to see you. And... Can you come over and have a look at them with me? Oh, yeah. 
Part of the RSPCA's plan is to alert the owners to the problem and hopefully encourage them to rectify the situation before it reaches tragic proportions and prosecutions are necessary. For Wakefield farmer Arthur Field, that For meant weeks. a good stern and warning. Those two there, and you see the one right down the back we're looking at? Over that back one. Can you tell me much about her? She's looking this way now. What, the heifer there? Yeah, what's the story on that one? Yeah. What's the story on her? Oh, she hasn't got no calf on her, has No, but she's not as good as she could be. Oh, no. When the RSPCA is called in, nothing escapes its yeah. notice. Well, in. This morning, a visit was also paid to Mr Field's fodder shed to ascertain just how he was going about feeding his stock. Yeah, well, we've got some more order down here. And when's that come in? Thursday. Thursday. Well, this is only Monday. You're going to have one yeah. bale go through till Thursday? Yeah, we'll get another one tomorrow. Well, you've got to keep a good number around because yeah. I'll be out in another couple of weeks' time yeah. and if those cattle have been improved, yeah. uh, you'll be prosecuted under the Crew and Animals Act. It was a turn of events, Mr Field admitted, he never expected. Were you aware that other people were getting worried about the cattle? No. Has it, has it been a bit of a, a shock to have the RSPCA turn up yeah, today? Yeah, I've never had me before. <laughs> you, uh, you don't think you'll ever have them back again? You'll be rectifying the problem? No, I'll give them a bit more now. These cattle were some of the lucky ones. For them, the RSPCA did arrive in time. But the story hasn't always had a happy ending across the Lower Hunter in recent weeks. For some starving and neglected stock, the help came just a little too late. These pictures pay testimony to the neglect occurring throughout the region in recent months. Taken on properties recently at Pocolbin and Hinton, many of these cows were too weak to even stand. They were destroyed on the spot. Some were atrocious. There's only one word for it. There's no excuse for most of it. Uh, I know they all try to tell you it's the cost of feed and it's the cost of this and it's very expensive, but really in speaking, it's the one word, management of properties. If you're going to have animals, whether it be horses, and we've had trouble with horses too, not just, just cattle, they're going to have to smarten their management up, otherwise they're just going to be prosecuted. For 30 year old Dave Perry, racing on Australia's bitumen roads is a pleasure compared to some of the cobblestone tracks in Europe. Back after three months of competition overseas, Dave says he thrived on the intensity of cycling in Belgium and Holland. The competition's very hard. It's, uh, if you have 100 stars, there's about 80 really good riders and the 20 that aren't so good. Uh, here, it varies a lot more. But Dave isn't resting on the laurels of his 10 top 10 finishes. It was straight back into training for the former state and Aussie rep, who is riding 1,000 kilometres each week, preparing for the Commonwealth Games and the eight-day Commonwealth Bank Classic. The hard slog on Newcastle's back streets seems an eternity away from Europe's premier amateur race, the Hetfelic 200km Classic, where Dave, by defeating Belgium, Swiss and Czech Olympic cyclists, became a sporting hero. They have lines of streets all the way along the route, and especially near the finish or on top of a hill, any point of interest, uh, there were people everywhere, masses of them.
Often visiting the art gallery is a rather daunting experience for children, but this program attempts to overcome that. The children are divided into small groups and under the leadership of a teacher and guide are introduced to the world of art. The children will visit the gallery three times in the next six months until they become used to finding their way around the building while absorbing the world of art in the process. To maintain interest, the guides carry a box of surprises. I believe that if you um, get them young and make them have a comfortable, enjoyable experience in the gallery, that means that they will have positive attitudes that will serve them well throughout their lifetime. Mr Baird was in Newcastle today to announce the members of the new local board. The chairman is Bruce Thompson, former general manager of Coal and Allied. His directors are Terry Lawler, chartered accountant, Laurie Steen of the Siemens Union, Barry Goldstiver from Tomago Aluminium, John Hannan from the Coal Association and the former Steelworks general manager, John Resby. The final member is MSB chief executive, Les MacDonald. While the new authority will not be fully autonomous, Mr Baird says within five years he thinks it will be. We're hoping that it's within a period of three years uh, minimum, maybe as long as five years, it will become a totally separate and autonomous port authority responsible for its own destiny, its own industrial relations, its own investment, its own infrastructure. So that uh, while there will be a transitional phase, you will be looking at Newcastle having total control over the port, all its assets, all its resources, and being able to compete against Sydney, against Port Botany, against Port Kembla, uh, to try and attract business to Newcastle, which is what you people should be about. The recent downturn in port activity hasn't daunted new chairman Bruce Thompson. He sees opportunities for new arrangements to make the port even more competitive. I think that the outgoing parent board in the MSB has done a very good job on restructure over the past few years and they've gone about as far as they could go in increasing efficiency within that structure. It is now time to look at, at a different, more modern structure which grants autonomy to the ports and we might have to survive a, a, a difficult time at the outset but I don't see that that can be not be fully addressed by having a, a, a regional and uh, almost autonomous board working on it. It's not only the people you see on stage that makes Cats the hit it is, but also the behind the scenes people like Lisa Nichols. Lisa has been working on Cats since it opened in Sydney four years ago. She's in charge of wigs and makeup, and today she took on the awesome task of turning me into a cat. <laughs> Applying the makeup can take up to an hour, but once it's completed and the nose and lips in place, the transformation is amazing. With her generous lips and contoured face, Bomb Ballerina is the sex siren of cats. So, what sort of character is Bomb Ballerina? Bomb Ballerina is a very um, gregarious, um, friendly cat. She's, I suppose you could call her the sex symbol cat of the show. She's a bit like Marilyn Monroe. Since I looked and felt the part of a true Cats performer, there was really only one thing left for me to do. Bob is ranked number one on the international circuit of dart professionals and is in the Hunter as part of a seven week Australian exhibition tour. Bob is one of only six professional dart players in the world making a living from endorsements and appearances. 
Last weekend, Bob played Russell Stewart. The top-ranked Australian player is also ranked number two in the world and defeated him six games to nil. Surprisingly, there are more than 6,000 registered dance players in Newcastle and the Hunter Valley. The old image used to be someone who was 25 stone and drank maybe uh, 30 middies in an evening and smoked 200 cigarettes during a game. Uh, there are still characters around like that and good luck to them. But uh, to survive in the top of the game, where you can be on your feet for a long time in a tournament, uh, there's no way you can stay there for very long if you're that kind of uh, shape. You know. In a full international tournament, Bob says he could be standing for more than 16 hours as they battle to find a winner. However, tonight there will be no lengthy stints in front of the board. Bob is playing only 16 games against the public at the Workers' Club. 60. The local team went into the semi-final as rank outsiders. Belmont is a young side of mainly year 9 and 10 players, but exceeded all expectations to make the final four out of the 130 schools which entered. Nine innings were played today with Belmont level pegging up to the third. But the skill of the Sydney side, which contained state player Brendan Kingman, eventually gained the upper hand. Belmont pitcher Clayton Harrison wound up to pitch the ball at around 100 kilometres an hour but the Bass Hill batters kept smashing it back to the outfield. Belmont was facing a hiding at 8-1, but fought back valiantly by the ninth to 8-5. The district office isn't the only one in Australia to be computerised, but this is the first to be updated in one step rather than in stages. One million dollars in computer hardware and software has been installed here and at the local exchange, giving staff a network of 100 personal computers. They have access to four systems covering customer billing and fault reports to accounts advice. District Manager Warren Parsons says staff have all been trained in readiness for the changes, but with four computer systems being introduced at once, he admits there's room for teething troubles. Most definitely. Uh, I suppose the advantage in that is that uh, we'll have all our teething problems out, out of the way at the one time as well. So, yes, we did have some problems. Member for Hunter Eric Fitzgibbon officially opened the new look office, which is expected to be a model for upgrading in other districts across the state. Today, the federal so, member for Newcastle, Alan Morris, so was even more confident about Newcastle's chances so of winning the $5 billion contract. Mr Morris said he'll be lobbying even harder to cabinet ministers before Monday's meeting, pointing out that their more flexible Dutch design is the Navy's preference, and the New Zealand withdrawal makes the choice even more straightforward. Well, for the last uh, four weeks, has been a consistent, and in recent days, an increasing uh, uh, feed-out from Navy into Canberra uh, about their preference for the Dutch vessel. Now, I think Navy was prepared to accept a lesser vessel uh, because it's, it kept New Zealand in with them. Uh, as they see New Zealand moving out of the picture, uh, th they're becoming very nervous about being, about being faced or being given a vessel which is inferior in their view uh, w without New Zealand being part of it. It seems that the Australian government considered all along that New Zealand would be part of the deal because it called only for tenders on 10 and 12 vessels. With New Zealand out, only eight vessels would be built, probably requiring new tenders to be submitted. The Newcastle manager of AWS, Commander Peter Shevlin, says there are plenty of companies willing and able to become involved. They couldn't get a, a piece of the action because we had to give some to New Zealand so they could be reapproached. And I would only imagine it would take a few weeks to re-tender and that would give us time to continue pressing the importance of the government selecting the better ship, not just the uh, cheapest unit price ship. And also stressing the big advantage. There are 
are six cinemas in all, each capable of accommodating 300 patrons in the latest standards of comfort and convenience. And the entertainment is presented with the Gee Whiz technology that increasingly critical film buffs have come to expect. All six cinemas are operated from the one control room, or bio box as it's known, with flexibility the key word. Huge spools of film feed six projectors with the facility to show the same movie in more than one of the cinemas at the same time. And the multi-channel sound equipment can faithfully convey the softest bird chirp to the loudest bang without distortion. It must be said that the aesthetics of the cinemas themselves are designed for lights out. But the foyer is a different story. Bright and inviting, the lolly shop and ice cream bar, the entrance will be finished by tomorrow night. Dozens of tradesmen working at feverish pace today will ensure that. And there is free unlimited parking, a feature which stands this complex apart from any inner city facility. Something we've been working on now for three years, and here it's finally here, uh, giving the cinema people, uh, the cinema going public, the ultimate in, in the cinema today. But why has it been, why has it taken so long? More than half the Hunter's kidney patients now undergo dialysis at home, but the system is complex and more than one person is needed to supervise the equipment. Until now, people who needed assistance had to spend their treatment time in hospital. The new $750,000 kidney centre takes the treatment back into the suburbs, and that's where it belongs, according to Director of Nephrology, Dr Alastair Gillies. Well, this is an immense improvement on what we've had previously. Uh, we've had, previous to this, we had to mix all the different kinds of dialysis patients together so that the people who are dialysing here today who are quite stable, independent, able to do their own dialysis and would be doing it at home except that they don't have a helper at home, were mixed in with all the acutely ill and sick people so that uh, they were in a hospital environment with all the psychological connotations of illness. The Wanzi Community Dialysis Centre was made possible through a bequest to the Kidney Foundation. Apart from providing 10 dialysis machines and staff, the centre will also become an education unit for home dialysis training. Dialysis patients must spend five hours on the machines three times a week. It's a tedious regimen, but the new centre at least makes the most of an unavoidable duty. This is fabulous. What was it like before? Oh, it was OK, but I mean, it was sterile sort of thing, you know, in a hospital, but out here it's more like, you know, well I couldn't say country club, but I mean, it's, it's nice to come out here, it's really lovely. Right. Thanks it's a pleasure much. to come here. With a howling southerly wind at their backs, the South Newcastle Lions took a while to get going, but when they did, they put the issue well and truly beyond doubt. Veteran winger Peter Sleep was on the end of a good Tim Butler pass after 15 minutes, and the winger did well to stay in the field of play and score the first try. And then Maitland paid dearly for having informed prop Milton Barrows sin bin for 10 minutes for what looked like a professional foul. In that 10 minute period, South ran in three tries with the first of those to half-back Brad Guy, who went from dummy half to cross near the posts. Big prop Todd Anderson made a huge break down the scoreboard flank, and from the short backline move that followed, it was Guy who stretched out to touchdown for South's third try. Then the Lions pushed their lead to 24-0 just before the break, when Nick O'Brien was on the end of an excellent backline movement, and the centre did the rest to score. To Maitland's credit, however, they hit back straight after half-time, with Burrows making up for his earlier misdemeanour, crashing over near the uprights, and then it was Greg Winchester who got the pumpkin pickers a little closer, scoring from a scrum win. But it wasn't enough as the Lions advanced to next week's showdown with Western Suburbs.